All right, so the schematics for this, uh, for this box, it's in the uh, place where they were still doing schematics in um, the service manuals. And uh, kind of around when Agilent took over, they stopped doing that. And you got, you got block diagrams, but you never got schematics anymore. So this is uh, a more, I would say more of a modern uh, analog design that you might see in a lot of really old HP schematics. So this is more kind of building block op amps and stuff that everybody should be quite familiar with. And uh, so let's just kind of take a quick look at the schematics and then I want to use this as a moment to uh, show how you can use schematics to learn. Okay, these designers of these products are really good designers. And a lot of times you'll see little tricks that they did and things you might not have thought of. And I found quite a few in here, so we'll go through it. But first of all, let's just kind of take a cursory look. You might wonder how they generate the sine wave in this uh, box. And it's actually, uh, I guess you would call it direct digital synthesis. It's, there's a waveform ROM, so the, the actual uh, sine wave is programmed in ROM. Okay, so this is a 12-bit, uh, 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 I mean, a uh, uh, 2 to the 12th uh, address lines and, and then an 8-bit an eight bit ROM. So the actual sine wave or that funny one where it was like straight and then it rang and then it's straight and then it rang, that's all programmed in this ROM and then you select which one you want to output. And then the clock signals will clock, clock the ROM and send out the digital data and then it goes into a D to A. So it, it's digitally stored in ROM, it's sliced up into eight bits and then it comes here into this uh, 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 digital analog converter. This particular digital analog converter they were using is current output. So then they had it run run through a current to voltage converter. Now they're here in voltage space. And then they can run it into amplifiers and filters and things like that. And then uh, the output uh, is is very nice. It's a uh, push pull uh, wrapped around a. Um, op amp, right? So the op amp is driving the the transistors here, gives you all the current, and then uh, we've seen this in audio amplifiers and everything. You put in a couple diodes to take care of the VBE drop of the of the transistors, and that k kills your crossover distortion. And then in addition to that, then you have a feedback, okay? And the feedback here is up and over, okay? So the feedback comes around to the negative and then the signal comes in the positive. Um, and then this has gain. So this resistor divided by this resistor is the gain of this loop. Okay, so you'd say, okay, great. Uh, I've done that before, everything is hunky-dory. But then they said, okay, we're gonna protect it a little bit. We wanna make sure that this thing never goes above 10 volts. And so they put in a couple back-to-back -back Zener diodes to have a clipping circuit here on the output to make sure it never generates more than 10 volts. So that's something that like the designer said, yeah, we need that. And uh, let's go ahead and put that protection in there. So yeah, I thought that was really, really interesting. Some other things on this uh, page that might be interesting um, is it has some of the power supply stuff in it. Now let's go to the beginning of the power supply here. And uh, let's take a look at this one. Uh, we just have a bridge rectifier, okay? The bridge rectifier goes in here, and this one generates the, um, the uh, plus 14 volts, and this one generates the minus 14 volts. And then um, that's, the way, that's the way this is being used. And we have a center tap that's, that's doing the ground. Now, Two things that are kind of a, a earmark of a great designer is they have a filter capacitor across here, 2200 microfarad, but they put a bleed resistor on it. So when you turn the instrument off, the capacitors just don't stay charged up all the time. There's a bleed capacitor. And there's a little bit of art about what values of resistance do you use on the bleed. This one wasn't too critical, so he just used 100K. So there's a 100K bleed on, on this one, 100K bleed here, and a 100K bleed here, okay? So you say, oh, that's really nice, uh, bleed capacitors. Okay, fine. But then it goes through the actual uh, regulator itself, and there is a, a large capacitor on the output of the, uh, of the voltage regulator. There's a 330 microfarad here, 100 here, and uh, 
what's down here, 100, 100 down here. Well, they also have bleed resistors across them, 100K, 100K, 100K. So you went ahead and put bleed resistors across those too. That's great. That's, that's, a, that's a good earmark. Another thing is he has protection diodes on these. So the, um, the plus 5 volt rail has a, has a protection. Make sure it doesn't go negative. The plus 14 has one. Make sure it doesn't go negative. And then the minus 14 has one. Make sure it doesn't go positive. So that's also a fancy thing. Now this one is, here's an even fancier thing that I don't think anybody would be thinking about doing. And that is, he, he thought about the actual feedback path of the voltage regulation. And he wanted to make sure it was regulating with a certain bandwidth. And so the feedback into this chip uh, that does the, this is like a 723 chip or something like that, that does the voltage regulation. Normally you just take a voltage divider and you run that into a comparator, which takes a look at a VREF. So here's the VREF over here, and here's the um, inverting thing to the comparator inside that checks uh, whether you're too high or too low. And it has a little variable resistor here, so you can set the 5 volts. But look at this. He put in a 0.1 microfarad capacitor and a 1.6K resistor that um, makes any AC ripple a little bit quicker. It feeds, it feeds in a little bit quicker. So if there's any quick fluctuation, this makes the, the loop a little bit faster and uh, the... Uh, uh, he he makes sure that it doesn't ring, but he makes sure that it's it's quick to, quick to respond. Okay, and he's done that in uh, the five volt section and the fourteen volt section. He's used the same trick in these two, and I haven't really looked at the minus fourteen. It I don't think it might have it. I think it's derived off the plus fourteen, so it's going to just uh, rely on this also, and it just gets mirrored to the minus fourteen. Another thing that he paid attention to was the input filtering just for the VREF. The VREF is just, uh, you know, a voltage coming in and it, and it gets generated in the side here, but you bring in a raw voltage. Well, he, he's, he's buffering that with a 2.2 microfarad capacitor in parallel with a 0.1 microfarad capacitor. So I did a video once on uh, effective ESR and um, uh, frequency responsive filter di filter uh, capacitors and stuff too. So he's using that here. He's got a 2.2 and a 0.1. Here he's got a 2.2 and a 0.1. So again, something that, you know, only an experienced designer probably would think about doing. Now something you may have never seen before, or you may have seen it and kind of scratched your head, is we all know that, let's take a look at this one here. We all know that when you do the bridge rectifier thing, you put a big, a big capacitor over here. Well, but before the bridge rectifier, there's a tiny little, um, a little capacitor over here, okay? I don't know if that's one microfarad or one picofarad. I think it's one microfarad. Um, so he's actually putting a capacitor across the transformer windings before, before it gets to the bridge rectifier. So most people would never think about putting a, that, uh, that capacitor. If you take a look at real fancy power supply designs though, yeah, they put those in there. They're called a snubber circuit. Um, uh, the, uh, Eddie over at Kiss Analog um, has some really good content on uh, these type of supplies. Um, they actually switch between positive and negative and positive and negative. So they're, they're actually causing current spikes at 120 hertz. And so you get this noise at 120 hertz that you have to you have to make sure you take care of. In addition to that, because you've got these current spikes, well, you've got a inductor over here, and that inductor is going to have current spikes on the inductor. Well, what does a current spike in an inductor do? Well, it causes ringing. Okay, and so this is a snubber circuit to create uh, to kill any ringing that this capacitor coil might generate. Okay. Uh, sometimes you'll see this capacitor instead of across the entire section here, you'll see one capacitor on each diode. So each diode will have a snubber capacitor on it. You'll see that done also. Okay. But again, a mark of an experienced uh, analog designer doing the, uh, doing the front end here. All right, let's take a look at another one. Uh, this is one of the receive circuits. 
Uh, let's see. Let's do the other one first. Let's do this one first. Um, so uh, it's quite complicated and you might look around here and you get to see some things that would be interesting, okay? So I did a series once on Salen key filters, active filters, and you can see a whole bunch of them in action up here. These are just textbook Salen key filters, put all the numbers in. This one creates the C message filter, which is a band pass. Here's a program filter, a different, different band pass. Here's a three kilohertz flat filter, so it would be a Butterworth filter. Here's a 15 kilohertz flat filter. Um, here's a 30 kilobit filter. Uh, here's a, uh, the P slash AR filter. That's that funny ringing one. There's a filter for that. There's a notch filter in here. When they look at the noise, uh, there's a one kilohertz notch filter, and that is created by doing a, a 995 hertz, a 1010 hertz, and a 1025 hertz filter, all put together to create the notch and the width that they wanted for that notch. And so you can take a look at the design of that. Uh, here's another 1K filter. It's a 1.01K uh, bandpass filter. Uh, you can take a look at amplifiers. There's a 25 dB amplifier. Anyway, so there's a whole bunch of on, on this page that you could learn from by looking at this. And it's all very, very straightforward analog design. Very, very simple textbook cookie cutter analog design. So uh, this one you should be able to learn how to do. Uh, on this page here, we have other things. Here we have a, uh, a 110 kilohertz filter low pass. Remember that the highest frequency thing, this thing will go to is 110, so they make sure that everything past 110 is rolled off. That's what this filter does. Um, there's some places where you have uh, analog signals, but you want to AC couple them, and you uh, need to have plus and minus signals. And so you put back-to-back -back, uh, capacitors in. Since so it's a 10 microfarad, 10 microfarad, they're put in back-to-back -back with the plus-plus uh, touching. So, so the input and output are on the negative side and uh, the middle is the positive. They do it again here. What I thought interesting though, the reason I wanted to point that out is on, is on, this page, <clears throat> they had another section where they had a, um, a 50 microfarad capacitor that's doing AC coupling, and they don't do back-to-back -back here. So this was probably one, one designer, and this was probably another designer. And this designer learned to do the back-to-back -back thing, and this designer said, yeah, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> so, so he did it that way. All right. Um, here's a really nice one. We'll end on this one. Uh, so, uh, let's see here. He's got a, uh, a an amplifier here, and um, he wants to put in an offset so he can adjust the offset really, really accurate. Because he's gonna he's gonna take this uh, input incoming sine wave and he's gonna clip it to do a uh, quadrature detector on it and stuff. And so he wants to make sure he's got a really accurate DC level. And so he has an offset here. Now, you know, us grunts might come along and do and do something crude where we have uh, uh, plus. 14 and minus 14 and then we just we just go here we say okay we'll, we'll find the value that we want well then that makes it not easy to adjust not very accurate so what he's done here is he take he's taken the 14 volts and he's divided it so if you just take a look at this he's got 50k and 100 ohms so he's dividing down this 14 volts by about uh, what, 500? Uh, yeah. So he's dividing it way down. So there's a very small voltage here, okay? Um, and he's done that on the minus 14 supply as well. He's put a divider, again, a 50K and 100 ohms. So he's got a very, po very small positive voltage here and a very small negative voltage here. And then 
he puts his potentiometer across that and makes that adjustment. So now he can really crank a lot on this thing and he can really fine tune this DC offset easily by putting in the circuit. Now it adds, it adds four resistors, but that was worth it to him to have this very fine adjustment. So that was a great trick. Um, I really like that circuit there. All right, so uh, just kind of a quick one. Take a look at uh, schematic diagrams. You can learn a lot from them, especially from the masters, like the guys at Tektronix or, or Agilent Keysight, whatever, um, and learn from, learn from those old timers. Learn, learn some good circuits. Take a look.